Welcome everyone, I'm Shah. Today I'm gonna to talk about how to solve problems with AI. Before getting into that, I'll just spend 60 seconds talking about my background. I got into AI about six, seven years ago when I was getting my physics PhD, I was an applied AI researcher. So just using AI to drive scientific discovery. After I graduated, I went and worked in industry at Toyota Financial Services, where I was doing the same kind of thing, but instead of applying AI to science, applying it to business. But after a year in that role, I decided I am the kind of person that enjoys the freedom of entrepreneurship despite all the challenges that comes along with it. I've done a lot of things these past couple of years. So I've done a bit of AI consulting, helped over 100 clients, made a lot of content. So maybe you guys have heard of me through my content channels on Medium and YouTube. I also started the course, which is part of the reason why I'm doing this lightning lesson. Taught over 115 students and also took a crack at AI product development. Made an app called Y2B, 211 users and a single whopping customer. What I'm gonna talk about today is the culmination of all this experience and academia and industry and working for myself and seeing a lot of small to medium sized businesses trying to build AI solutions. So the typical story of founders using AI or small to medium sized businesses using AI is something like this. Someone sees something or has some kind of chat GPT experience or they have a conversation at a cocktail party and then they realize that AI is changing everything and that they need to use it. What comes next is brainstorming project ideas. Once you have a list of all these ideas, you just pick the most exciting one and then you spend something like three months trying to build a prototype, hiring consultants and freelancers, burning through your runway, demoing it to very polite customers. And then at the end of it, you know, maybe you don't even ship the thing and you make no money. And then you just add it to this pile of 90% of AI projects fail. And you know, that's what it is, but there must be a better way. Let's talk about another story. So I'll call this story two, and this is an alternative approach to building with AI. Instead of starting with the excitement, starting with the question of what problems do I have or what problems do my customers have? From there, you can pick the problem with the greatest expected impact, which I'll talk about a little later. Once you've picked a problem, now you're in a position to brainstorm solutions. Once you have these solution ideas, you can pick one and scope out a minimum viable product. So basically, what is the most simple and basic version of this solution that we can build quickly that will give us some value? Then you can build it as quickly as possible using AI tools, of course. And then at the end of it, you'll either profit, hopefully, or at the very least, you're gonna learn something which is going to allow you to profit in a future solution. So why this way? And I just wanna take a step back and compare these two stories. And really the key difference here is what people might call the hammer problem. Charlie Munger calls it man with the hammer fallacy. There's a lot of different labels for this phenomenon, but it's basically this idea of when you start with a technology or a solution, like a very shiny hammer, we have this quirk of human psychology that we just start seeing everything as a nail. We start seeing the solution of all our different problems as being solved by a hammer. When you start with just using AI, instead of starting with the problem, you start going around and you know, just trying to solve everything with AI. So you're just going around trying to whack every problem with a hammer. And of course, this can lead to you doing silly things like trying to fix a leak with a hammer, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So a different way we can do this is something like story two, but distilling it into a five-step framework. These are the five steps here. So basically what we talked about in story two, so picking a problem, brainstorming solution, scoping the MVP, building the MVP, and then reflecting on it. So let's just go through these one step at a time. Step one is to pick a problem, ideally one that you have real world experience with. And so if you're building a solution for yourself, like it's an internal thing, or you're just trying to build solutions to make your life easier, make your work easier, this should be a given. So for me, I have many different problems, such as writing LinkedIn posts takes too much time. LinkedIn is a major client acquisition channel for me. Conversions are too low on my course landing page, kind of like what someone put in the chat earlier. They need more contracts. They need more clients. So this is like a universal problem. Editing my podcast takes way too long. And if you have a podcast or have done any kind of video editing, you can probably relate to this. Free users are not becoming paid users for my SaaS. So that's a massive problem for a lot of different founders or my YouTube channel isn't growing fast enough. So if you boil it all down, it's I don't have enough time or I don't have enough customers. So very universal problems. So this is like the foundation of getting value from AI. Instead of just trying to start with, let me try to build some kind of agent or some kind of chatbot, starting with the problem because this is gonna be the foundation with which we build something that actually makes an impact. If you're not just building something for yourself, but you're trying to turn this into a product or you're trying to make this like a productized service. So maybe
maybe there's still a human in the loop, but you're like getting clients and you're doing a lot of the work with some kind of internal tool that you're building for yourself. It's important that you consider like not just your ability to build it, but also the need. The need is basically asking the question, is this problem painful enough to enough people to build a business around? It could be a massive pain, but you have to consider the second thing as well, which is your skills. So do you have the insight and the ability to be helpful to people that have this problem? And so it's really these two factors together that's going to determine your probability of success. Because if no one cares about a problem, it doesn't really matter how good you are at solving it. And then the reverse of that is even if something's a massive problem, but you don't have the skills to provide value, that's still not going to be a successful venture. And so if we're just evaluating these problems from the previous slide, just doing like a simple thing like low, medium, high for each of these dimensions. So I would say the need for landing page conversion and ascending for users is super high. This is like directly related to revenue and bottom line for businesses. Everyone's going to be interested in something like this. Something that there is a need for, but probably not as painful is LinkedIn post writing or podcast editing or growing a YouTube channel. While this is correlated to customer acquisition, it's not directly related and it might be a little fuzzy. But even though landing page conversion and ascending free users has a very high need, I clearly don't know how to do that super effectively. So I'd put my skills as low for those things. But for LinkedIn post writing and growing a YouTube channel, I've been doing that for a few years. So I know a little bit about each of those. So I put my skills as medium. So from this view, even though the landing page conversion or sending users is probably like a huge market opportunity, I think I'm probably better suited to go after the LinkedIn post writing solution or a solution to help people grow their YouTube channels. But let's say here, I'm just going to go for the LinkedIn post writing solution. If you're building a product, the easiest way to improve this column here, this dimension, like your skill sets, what you bring to the table is instead of trying to solve your current problems is to solve your past problems. For me, like posting on LinkedIn is not a problem anymore, but that was a massive pain for me in the past. Maybe I can target that customer or getting your first thousand or 10,000 subscribers on YouTube is not a pain for me anymore. So I've done that. So that could be a customer avatar as well. I think that's like a helpful heuristic. If you're trying to solve problems for other people, look toward problems that you've already solved for yourself in the past. Now that we've identified a problem, we can brainstorm solutions. So let's say we're going for this writing LinkedIn post takes way too much time. Let's think of possible solutions. And here it's not about AI solutions or even software solutions, just any solution that might solve this problem. Here's a ton of them. I could come up with these LinkedIn post templates. I could come up with 100 viral LinkedIn hooks for tech founders, 50 viral LinkedIn posts and why they worked, a custom GPT equipped with viral hooks and posts, an LLM prompt that people can paste their style into, a SaaS where people upload posts and the system learns their style, ghostwriting services for tech founders. Maybe it's like a productized service. So I have some internal tool that I use to do the ghostwriting for people. A LinkedIn writing mastermind. So this is no tech involved whatsoever. A rule-based app, a Mad Lib style post generator done with you writing session. And so there's so many different ways we can solve this problem. But just having this laundry list of solutions isn't super helpful. So what we can do, and probably many people are familiar with this approach, is creating this value versus effort plot. So basically two dimensions, you have value on the y-axis, effort on the x-axis, and you just give an estimate, best guess, of where you would place each of these potential solutions. And then from this view, we get these four quadrants. We have the high effort, high value, ghostwriting services for tech founders. Like that is, it can be fast, it can be easy and it can be good. That's like everything tech founders want, but this is high effort because it requires your time or it requires you finding copywriters to hire on and fulfill the services. And then we can go on the opposite end, like low effort, low value. So like an LLM prompt that people can paste their style into. So this might be pretty easy. You just write a prompt for ChatGPT or something like that. You can make it in probably a few hours, but it's probably not going to be super valuable for people. An argument could be made for either of these, but of course what you want to totally avoid is like these high effort, low value things. So so let's see, like a rule-based app that gives the users prompts for new post ideas. It's gonna take a while to build this app from scratch. And at the end of it, it may not be much more valuable than just giving them example posts that they can use. But really where you wanna be is like this low effort, high value area. This idea is creating a custom GPT equipped with viral hooks and post ideas. A custom GPT is, you can do that on the ChatGPT website. You just put in your prompt, you can add tools and all this kind of stuff. So it's basically like writing an LLM prompt that people can paste their style into, but it has like the nice UI and you can add tools to it whatsoever. So that's a really fast way of testing whether this solution 
is helpful to people. But of course, you know, the arguments could be made for something up here or something down here as well. But let's just say for this project, this is the solution I want to move forward with. Okay, so now that we have a solution, we can scope out the MVP. And I think here, the most important question to ask yourself is what does success look like? This means success metrics. So these are clear, quantifiable goals that can be objectively evaluated in this pass fail way. Some examples of this is a 50% decrease in post writing time. It could be a 100% increase in post impressions. This kind of solves the problem indirectly of it takes too long to write LinkedIn posts. Because if you're getting double the impressions, you can write half as many posts. So in the same amount of time, you get double the impact. These first two are more like technical success metrics. But then this one is more like a business metric of 30% of people who go to your landing page will sign up for the app or will sign up for the wait list or whatever it might be. Or a similar thing is like 20% of the free users ascend to paid users. So that's like another business success metric. So let's say for here, I come up with this goal of the average post writing time for 10 random prompts is decreased by 5x. So if it's typically typically takes me 30 minutes to write a LinkedIn post, success would be bringing that number down to like five or six minutes. Another aspect of scoping the MVP is setting the constraints. So this can be all sorts of different types of things. So this could be like the tech stack. My perspective on this is you always want to build with what you know, because you don't want to spend like three months trying to learn a new framework or new technology, because in that time, everything has completely changed. You know, maybe like some new models have shipped, maybe some new frameworks have come out. Build with what you know, because that's what's going to allow you to build the fastest, and that's the most important important thing in the AI landscape today. The other thing is budget. And you know, for this, you probably don't really have to worry much about it. Basically, anything you want to build can be built for under $100. And that's a very big budget, actually, for a lot of MVPs. For example, the y to b app I created, the most expensive thing was getting the domain, which I think was like $50. Doing all the experiments and the actually running the app was very cheap. Latency. So sometimes this might be important if like the app has to be fast. Or the flip side is if it's fine to be slow, then that's going to inform the kind of model you want to use. Picking a model, I don't think it really matters. GPT-5 just came out. You can do that. You can do Gemini 2.5. You can do Claude 4 with thinking. So just pick the biggest, smartest model you can within your budget and latency, because that's the frontier of like the best performance you can get. And then you can always go to a smaller model if you want to get latency or savings on your budget. But this last thing I would say is probably the most important, which is the timeline. Here, I think it's helpful to give yourself less time than you think you need to build it because that's going to spark creativity and motivation to actually get it done. And again, like the most important thing today, because this landscape is changing so quickly is speed. So the faster you can build your idea and put it into the real world, that's going to be one of the most important factors for success. Step four is actually building the MVP. So there's so many options today, like it's never been easier to build an MVP that is actually valuable, lovable and N8N. These are like super viral, super popular solutions. I haven't personally use these a lot. The custom GPT is what uh, we mentioned earlier, but it also doesn't have to be like these AI tools. It can be like pretty basic stuff. Like you can build an MVP with like a Zapier automation or even like a Notion dashboard or even a newsletter. So you can like curate a bunch of information all locally, or you have some process for doing that. And then you can just like send out a newsletter to people. So an MVP can look a lot of different ways and it doesn't have to be restricted to just building like a website or a web app. Of course, the no code path is the fastest way to do it, but it also comes with this downside of limited customization. The coding path, main thing you want to consider here is what kind of AI, like what kind of software are you going to use to build out different parts of your MVP? And so here we really have three options. There are three types of software, and this is language popularized by Andre Karpathy. The first option is software 1.0. This was AI for like the first 50 years of its existence. So these are just rule-based systems. This is things just like writing traditional software. Then came this other kind of software, which we call machine learning. So here, instead of explicitly writing out the instructions in computer code, you can program computers by example. So you have a specific task that you want your app to do. All you have to do is give it a lot of examples of that task and the computer can learn how to do that. But now we have this third kind of software today, which are large language models where you don't even have to give it examples. You can just write clever prompts, give it a lot of helpful context, and it'll be able to do very complicated tasks. There might be a bias today to to just like solve all your problems with large language models. But it's important to always try to solve it with code if you can, because this is going to be more predictable and it's going to be much cheaper to run. When trying to make this decision,
decision between the three types of software, each have their pros and cons. And so these are a few different dimensions you might want to consider. There's dev time. So of course, like building with LLMs is super fast. <laughs> you can just like create something in like a few minutes, like 15 minutes or something. And then the dev time of writing the whole app yourself is going to be higher with software 1.0. But of course, you know, this could be a little easier. You just have GPT-5 or Claude 4 write the whole app for you. There's also task performance. Software 1.0, you'll probably hit a ceiling pretty quickly on what you can get a computer to do with just logic that you write yourself. But LLMs can do very complicated tasks that are not well-defined or take unstructured data. This is another win for large language models. But then here's the downside. You know, all this comes at a cost, which is compute cost. So software Software 1.0 is always going to be the cheapest. It's going to be the fastest and it's going to cost you the least amount of money to run. Machine learning is going to be higher cost. And then the highest cost, of course, is going to be large language models. These are all important things to consider. And it's just trade off of like, you know, how fast do you want to build it? What kind of performance do you need on the task? And how much are you willing to spend in terms of money and time? And so this is the final step and probably what people don't spend enough time on, but it's to reflect and try to understand what went well, what didn't go well. So basically, when you have the success metric, when you scoped out your MVP, this makes this process a lot simpler because you can simply ask, did you hit your success metric or did you not hit your success metric? So it's this binary yes, no thing. If you did, that's great. Now you can ask yourself, how can I make it better? How can I take this to the next level? How can I actually start making money from it? If you didn't hit the success metric, you always want to ask why and understand what went wrong. For example, let's say you kind of dig deeper and you feel like you've identified the root cause of why you didn't hit your success metric, then you can push. So you can try to fix the MVP, try again, define another success metric, and then try to hit that. Or you can pivot. So basically picking a new solution or picking a new problem. Okay, so I think we're right on time, which is perfect. So we'll do Q&A in a second, but I'll spend 60 seconds talking about the AI Builders Bootcamp. Next cohort starts August 15th. So it's a six week cohort. We've got weekly live sessions, pre-recorded modules, bunch of code examples, weekly TA office hours, private community of builders, direct project feedback from me and our TA Bryce. We've also got bonus lectures from course alumni. And then we also do peer groups if you're into that. As of this really, made for you know tech founders tech consultants side hustlers trying to build with ai the uh, course is 995 but as a bonus for joining this lightning lesson you can get a 20 percent discount using the code lightning20 at checkout